Hello, and welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions through the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore Ampersand Books. I'll put the links in the chat. We're so excited to have Heather Lanier with us this evening. First, we'll hear her read, then she'll be in conversation with Stephen Cusisto. Stephen Cusisto directs the Burton Blatt Institute's Programs in Disability at Syracuse University, where he holds a university professorship. He is the author of the memoirs Have, Will, Have Dog, Will Travel, A Poet's Journey, Planet of the Blind, and Eavesdropping, a memoir of blindness and listening, as well as three poetry collections. Heather Lanier's memoir, Raising a Rare Girl, has been praised by author Kim Brooks as an arresting and beautiful book about the transformative power of unconditional love. Lanier has also published two award-winning poetry chapbooks, The Story You Tell Yourself and Heart-Shaped Bed in Hiroshima. Her essays and poems have been published in The Atlantic, The Sun, Salon, Brevity, Vela Magazine, and el elsewhere. And her TED Talk, Good and Bad Are Incomplete Stories We Tell Ourselves, has been viewed over two million times. She teaches creative nonfiction at Rowan University. Heather, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Dan, for having me. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Huge thanks to Steve, um, who's taught me much of what I know. Um, so I'm going to read from the first chapter of Raising a Rare Girl. Um, this is the hardback. The paperback just came out. Um, the paperback has a little picture of Fiona on it. And if you go to Instagram, you can hear and watch Fiona and I unboxing them and she gets to see herself there. Um, she, she, had, she approved the cover beforehand, but it was exciting to see. So I'm gonna read from the first chapter of this book just so you get a sense of like what, like what narrative questions the book is setting up, but also like what kind of philosophical questions too it starts to set up. So from chapter one, when I was pregnant, I tried to make a super baby. I didn't realize I was doing this. I thought I'd long ago shed the theory that a body could be made perfect. But looking back, my goal was clear. I swallowed capsules of mercury-free DHA to help grow my super baby's brain. I filled my grocery cart with organic fruits and veggies, letting our monthly food bill consume a quarter of our income. Of course, I followed the medical advice standard for women of my generation. I avoided soft cheeses and cold cuts and I microwaved my smoked turkey slices so they curled into crispy edged frisbees. But I went above and beyond. I gave up wheat for reasons I forget. I kept my flip phone at least an arm's length away from my belly to avoid damaging my super baby with electromagnetic waves. I tried not to let a kernel of GMO corn touch my estrogen laden tongue. I spoke to my super baby, welcoming it into my body so it would feel loved and supported. I avoided finding out my super baby's sex so I wouldn't project gender roles onto her, him, them. I slept on my left side because I'd read it was best for my circulation, which was in turn best for babies. In the last months, I never once reclined on a sofa because I'd heard the position could put a baby posterior, which would dramatically increase my chances of having a C-section, which would rob my baby of certain bacteria that was beneficial for reasons cited in an academic journal I couldn't explain. Instead, I always leaned forward, my elbows propped on my spread knees like I was forever on the verge of imparting a proverb. And I prepared meticulously for an unmedicated birth. In the final months of pregnancy, I ended each hip aching day by popping earbuds into my ears, 
closing my eyes and listening to Hypno Babies, a natural birthing program that guided me through self-hypnosis. My baby will be born healthy and at the perfect time, a woman's voice uttered as I descended into a dreamy soup of electronic accords and affirmations. My body is made to give birth nice and easy. I look forward to giving birth with happiness. My baby is developing normally and is healthy and strong. The words were supposed to lodge in my subconscious, creating the reality I wanted, a pain-free birth and a perfect child. I focus on all going right. After 36 hours of labor, the last five of which can best be described as an apocalypse in my perineum, I pushed my baby out and into the warm waters of a hospital tub. For a second, she dangled before me, legs curled toward her chest. Without my glasses, my child appeared to me as a bean-shaped blur suspended in midair. My husband, Justin, later told me that this was the point at which the nurses became palpably anxious. A peanut, just said the midwife, just the whittle peanut. That was about the kindest thing a medical professional would say about my newborn's body. Put baby right on mama's chest, the books had told me, because oxytocin would flow and enhance super baby with strong bonding. That was in our birthing plan. But the midwife ordered my husband, dad, you need to cut the cord. We were gonna wait until the cord stops pulsing in a voice used to direct people swiftly, but without panic toward an emergency exit, she, she said, no, we need to get baby on the table now. My husband took scissors to the cord and just like that, the stranger who'd lived inside me for nine months was detached, then whisked from my fuzzy line of vision. Too spent from the 36 hour feet, I closed my eyes and felt the weight of the nine months lift. I'd made it to the other side. I moved to a bed flat on my back, waiting to deliver the placenta, I turned my head to the nurse beside me. Is the baby okay? I asked. Labor thrusts a woman into the psychological stratosphere and I was coming back down. But the nurse didn't answer. A few minutes later though, the midwife returned with my new family member. She's fine, she said, just small. And there she was, my daughter, this product of wheatgrass and self-hypnosis and free range eggs of hope and risk and love in a maddeningly loud biological urge. She lay on my chest, perplexed and limp. Her vernix covered head was no larger than a grapefruit. My hand cradled its entirety. Her black eyes stared up at me, alert and confused. My husband curled beside me and gazed at her in awe. Someone snapped a photo. Welcome to the world, I said. A nurse was inflating a blood pressure cuff around my arm or at least one very small corner of the world, I added. The nurse laughed through her nose. A baby receives her first test within 60 seconds of birth. Anesthesiologist Virginia Apgar created the Apgar assessment in 1952 to study the effects of anesthesia on newborns, but the test also proved useful in determining whether a baby needed immediate medical interventions. Is baby's heart beating? Is baby breathing? Is baby reactive? These questions and others help a doctor, midwife, or nurse calculate a baby's immediate health post-birth. And the medical professional assigns the baby a score on a scale from zero to 10. Zero means the baby has no pulse, isn't moving or breathing, doesn't respond to a mild pinch, and is bluish gray or pale. 10 means the baby is actively moving, responds strongly to a mild pinch, has a heart rate of at least 100 beats per minute, is a healthy color and breathes robustly enough to produce a, quote, satisfying cry, as Apgar wrote. When I was pregnant with Fiona, I saw that women on natural birthing websites used the Apgar score as a measurement for their achievements. Within the very first minute of a newborn's life, a mother could get confirmation of her child's super baby status. Mothers who made it through birth without any drugs sometimes brag that their babies scored a quote, perfect 10. Apgar herself acknowledged that a score of 10 is unusual given that most newborns have slightly blue hands or feet immediately after birth. 
The phrase perfect 10 always reminded me of short-haired Olympian Mary Lou Retton dismounting the gymnastics vault in her American flag leotard, arms held high. I both resisted the mother's competitive tone and kind of bought into it. I also figured the competition was a modern day perversion of Afgar's purpose, a byproduct of the perfectionistic pressures that middle-class women of my generation felt. But the language of competition is embedded in Virginia Afgar's own writing. In her 1953 proposal for this, quote, new method of testing babies, she talks about, quote, grading of the newborn infant and, quote, giving a score to the patient. She writes, it has been most gratifying to note the enthusiastic interest and competitive spirit displayed by the obstetric house staff who took great pride in a baby with a high score. In other words, striving for super babies has roots 70 years old and older still. In the Dayton hospital, after my daughter Fiona was whisked away for those few minutes, the midwife was examining her body, asking, asking questions, how was the baby breathing? How fast was her heart beating? Was her body moving? What color was her skin tone? And did she respond to stimulation? Fiona's scores at the one and five minute marks were a respectable eight and nine. Apgar called her, quote, normal. It was the first and last time anyone would. Fiona had been born in the evening and by the next morning, a single task had been scrawled on my room's whiteboard beneath the phrase patient goals. That word was rest. In my 32 years, I'd never seen such a short to-do list. But as the first morning wore on, it became clear from the nurses and doctors that I needed to do something else. I needed to worry. Fiona was four pounds, 12 ounces. Given the nurses and doctors shock when they relayed this weight to one another, I learned that four pounds, 12 ounces was an alarming size for an infant born full term. Someone showed me a chart on which seven half rainbows shot across graph paper. The half rainbows began close together at the word birth, each somewhere between five and nine pounds. This chart illustrated the weight range of normal babies at birth and beyond. There was a handwritten X below all of them, scratched in ballpoint pen. This was Fiona, someone told me. She was in the bowels of the chart. The morning after Fiona's birth, a pediatrician came to perform an examination. He was tall and lanky and had a gentle demeanor. I liked him. He lifted 18 inch Fiona in the air using a one-handed grip on her torso. Then he rotated her body 180 degrees he ran his hand along her back, her spine, her wee ribs, her day old skin. She's got good tone, he said. I had no idea what this meant, but I took faint pride. But the doctor's face remained pensive. He detailed the potential problems for a too small baby, low blood sugar, trouble regulating her own body temperature. She might need to spend time in the NICU, he said. Something about the word NICU pierced my faith. My shoulders curled forward toward my food tray and I wanted to burst tears into my fruit cup. My postpartum emotions had turned on a dime. There must be a reason, he said, meaning of her small size. Mom, did you gain the proper weight? I nodded. Each week while pregnant, I watched the scale tip up a pound or two. The doctor took one last look into Fiona's bassinet and sighed. There was no need for the NICU, he said, not yet, and he left the room. My husband had no problem taking the command of rest on the whiteboard literally. He stretched his lean six feet on the double bed, shut his eyes and napped. Fiona was asleep. Alone, I fixated on her face. I scanned her pale features and tried to read them. The flat nose bridge, the centimeter slit of a mouth, the slanted small eyes. Something about her eyes looked different to me. Maybe it was the absence of eyelashes. I laid down and tried to sleep. I focus on all going right, the hypnosis woman had said. But then there was a shift change and a new nurse entered my room, someone who hadn't just seen me squeeze a person from my person without medication. And she asked a question that felt like a face slap. Mom, did you take any drugs while pregnant? 
No nurse, I wanted to say. I took superfoods. I took Reiki. I took electronic accords and affirmations. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And I'll just summarize that everybody in the hospital is stressed about Fiona's four pounds, 12 ounces. Um, they're waking me and my husband up every, every hour or two to try to get her fed so she would grow. Um, and eventually they kick us out of one room that was like really nice and had a jacuzzi tub and uh, like a real bed and, and moved us down into this like closet of a hospital room. Um, so we were, we had to stay there, but we were definitely um, frustrating the staff. Um, and we got the feeling that we'd like done something wrong, you know. So the next section here. And yet we carried with us the luminous being that was our baby. Fiona had searching onyx eyes, lit with the wonder of consciousness. She pressed her right fist to her cheek and extended an inch long finger toward the corner of her mouth like she was thinking interesting baby thoughts. She had a smushed nose and through nostrils smaller than peas took in air. When Justin placed his hand over her body, he covered her entire torso and then some. His fingers grazed her chin and the heel of his hand reached her thighs. And yet beneath that hand was every major organ she'd need, her heart, maybe the size of a strawberry, her lungs like the teeniest upside down trees, her stomach and her liver and kidneys, all of it below the blanket of her father's hand. She had a high forehead and a light brown fuzz on her oblong head, which made her look like a miniature old man. The combination of her nearly bald head and her perfectly unwrinkled skin made her seem both vernal and ancient, like she contained everything of the past and nothing but the future. Her skin was mesmerizing in its newness, nearly seamless, untouched by sun or soil. And although I'd been a chronic skeptic for decades, practicing doubt in my life as much as faith, she looked divinely made. Humans made polyester and nail polish remover, plastic sandwich baggies and spackle. We made nothing so luminescent as this. That next morning with the sunlight streaming through the window of our tiny room, we needed to break free into the greater world which loved all babies and wouldn't harass us for making one who fell off the growth charts. The problem my husband and I decided was not Fiona's small size. It was this place and its bizarre contradictions. Congratulations, now worry, rest but wake up, wake up. We sat in that room together, taking turns holding Fiona, awaiting the discharge papers. The on-call pediatrician will come and do a final check, a nurse said. Then you can go home. I relaxed at the thought of one final hurdle before our escape. The new pediatrician was a shadow hunched over my baby. I sat cross-legged on my narrow hospital bed, wondering when I might scarf down another meal. This new pediatrician was even more suspicious than the first. He said nothing like, she's got good tone. He made no cute coos, offered no chirpy hellos. He looked at my girl with displeasure. What was the placenta like, he asked. Anything unusual about it, was it small? If you've ever seen a placenta, you know there is everything unusual about it. The one that came out of my body was a red blob with a network of veins in its center, like a bird clock clutching, clutching tight. It was a temporary organ my body had grown without me ever ordering it up. It was grotesque magic. I'd marveled when the midwife had shown it to me. I made that, but I had no idea how it compared in a lineup of other placentas. I don't know, I told the doctor. He kept looking at my baby. He kept looking at the human I gestated for nine months, the one who'd grown in a room of my body I'd never seen. I knew her more intimately than any other person, and yet I hardly knew her at all. She was a small son in an air-conditioned room, a mystery to orbit eternal. If it's not the placenta, he said, then it's the baby. What was it? His pronoun was a stuffed suitcase splitting at the zipper. It was a problem. The doctor and I were on different floors of thought. You see, he said, before dropping the bomb, it's either bad seed or bad soil. I wasn't so sleep deprived to lose the thread of his logic. I was the soil, 
my daughter was the seed. My newborn, according to his expert eyes, was a bad plant. He left, I cried, a sandwich came, I tried to eat it. I'm gonna read one more section of this. This is the end of this chapter. With discharge papers in hand, my husband and I fled in the opposite fashion one usually flees, as slowly as possible. Justin merged onto I-75 with the gentle care of a grandpa. He drove in the right-hand lane five miles below the speed limit. I sat in the back seat with our new family member who was bean shaped and nearly engulfed by her gargantuan car seat. Fiona was her name, but the word on her onesie was fragile, stenciled in the font used for cargo crates. When a friend had given it to us months ago, I was dubious of its size. No way a person could be so small, but now my baby swam inside it, her lean torso lost in the white folds, her wrists poking out of the short sleeves where underarms should be. She was too small for the smallest clothes. She was too small for fragile. A semi roared past in the center lane and I cast an arm across Fiona's car seat, feeling a flash of fury at the world's steel and speed. Her child was a wiggling riddle. How could she be both miraculous and medically concerning? She couldn't, was my answer. He's wrong, that doctor, I thought. She's fine, she's just small. In one way, this was the voice of wisdom whispering truth from my gut. She's fine. But I made that wisdom speak more than it could. She'll catch up, I added. We'll show them. We exited the highway slowly. We took the familiar turns to our little house in a suburb of a suburb of Cincinnati. If Fiona cried in the cab of the car, I don't remember. If the radio played, I don't remember. In my memory, in my memory there's only silence as my husband and I move forward. My arm lies across the car seat like an extra safety belt. My neck is craned so I can see between the front seats and spot any danger. My husband's hands are at 10 and two. We are uncharacteristically cautious about a 20 mile drive. We're driving with the quiet of a hundred unknowns, questions we know but can't answer and questions we don't know at all. Among the known questions, is something wrong with the baby? My encounter with that second pediatrician was a bucket of ice water on my postpartum head, either bad seed or bad soil. But his words were a useful forewarning, one I couldn't yet hear. The world will not always see your beloved as good. And because I couldn't hear the forewarning, I couldn't hear its conjoined questions, the biggest of the things I didn't know. How? Will you love such a person anyway? How will you reconcile the noisy values of the culture with the bursting pangs in your chest? I knew this. I already loved her so much it hurt. Thanks folks, that is the end of chapter one. Thanks for listening. See what's going on out there now. I think I'm allowed to turn my camera on. Yeah, do it. Turn it on, Steve. I'm I'm back from the uh, orbiting station. How was the space station? It was very good. Uh, <laughs> it 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 was informed by the eternal orbit, uh, which is of course a thing of sublime beauty. Uh, <laughs> so the first thing I want to say, as your interlocutor locutor tonight, is just what an astonishingly beautiful book this is. And sometimes books are beautiful because of the language. Uh, and this has beautiful language. Sometimes books are beautiful because of the sort of romantic arc of the narrator's quest and the discoveries along the way. This book has those things too. But the real reason it's beautiful to me is that it's a book of ardor. It's a book of the marriage of ardor uh, and wisdom. Mm. And that's a rare girl and a rare book, right? Uh, Thanks, Steve. So, so I think the first question I want to ask is ineloquently, inelegantly as I'm doing it, is was there a point when you were writing where 
you know, rising out of the circumstances of being Fiona's mother mm. and struggling with the horrid medical industrial complex yeah. with all of its ableism and its paternalism and its patriarchy mm -hmm. and all the fears and struggles. Was there a moment in the writing of the book where you realized or you felt mm. that in the writing something larger was occurring? Yes. Yeah. Um, Cause this, I think that's an important part of what the book is about. Yeah, I mean, for me, well, here's where I, like, it's, I don't know how to even say this or. Uh, yeah, I know it's not easy, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Cause it, it, it is a spiritual thing. Right, so I will, so I'll just say like, um, I've been, let's see, I, I was a uh, baptized, Christian late in the game because um, I, I got the chance to choose and um, it was always you know I talk like I mentioned that one line that it was like I practiced doubt and faith both probably just as much maybe doubt even more um, but you know in the past like the, those years uh, early years with Fiona I was writing a lot um, and was also just like learning a lot more about um, about the Christian tradition and like the Holy Spirit and what that is. And it dawned on me that the way that I encounter what Christians would call the Holy Spirit was through writing. And that every time I sat down to write, um, it felt like a, a communion with something larger, like that it was me and this something larger trying to tell this bigger thing that was bigger than any, um, that was truer than any story about what it, what it meant to be human and why we were human that I had been, I guess, given um, from a lot of the culture, I guess, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, it does. And, you know, I, I've written a lot about disability over the years. And one of the things that I find consistent in my own work is the ongoing effort to find beauty and wonder and mm -hmm. curiosity an openness, uh, not only in my life, but the lives of others, while simultaneously navigating a world that doesn't like me, mm -hmm. or doesn't like the disabled, mm -hmm. finds us inconvenient, mm -hmm. uh, would find ways to just shunt us off <laughs> back to the asylum, uh, out of the mainstream, right? We yeah. forget that the ADA is only 30 years old. Yeah. And, that, uh, you know, the the, the place of the disabled or those who are markedly different in the public square is such a recent phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And so your daily life as a writer, as a thinker, as a agent for change, as a, as a thought leader, as a parent, mm -hmm. uh, is it's that challenge to be, to stay curious, mm. stay open, and keep the love, keep the love doors open. Yeah. Uh, in, in the midst of these terrible doctors. Yeah. Uh, you know, I after I left Ohio State where we met, yeah. I went and taught at Ohio at Iowa in nonfiction, but I also taught over in the medical school. And my assignment, such as it was, was to talk to you know baby doctors, mm -hmm. uh, and get them to understand that the five most awful things they the the worst things they could the worst thing they could say to a patient or a parent mm -hmm. you know is i'm sorry there's nothing more i can do for you mm. right that that's that's the legacy of of medicine mm. that the disabled the you know the rare child <laughs> the mm -hmm. rare patient mm -hmm. uh, we either cure them or they're inadmissible yeah, yeah. Right. And my job was to try to the best of my ability with many different, you know, visual aids and um, <laughs> amusing poems and uh -huh. rattles and, you know, unguents. And, but it was to get them to understand that uh, the body that can't be cured is just a human body. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and it may be the most numerous human body of them all. Right. And that that human body is still a citizen uh, and 
it must be given all the you know opportunities and love and engagement that any citizen is given yeah and don't let the deficiencies of your medical education stop you from understanding that right that yeah 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 i mean it took it was i mean um you know the book begins i'd like to have quoted the entire poem that you wrote it begins with a quote from you which is from your beautiful poem the souls of disabled folks which i've like stumbled across in Fiona's first year on your blog. So Steve, those of you who don't know, has this great blog called Planet of the Blind. Um, and you, you can subscribe and it goes right to your inbox, which I do. Um, but like when I stumbled across this poem called The Souls of Disabled Folks, I was in the middle of like Fiona's first year and we were going to doctors all the time. And it, right. it was so helpful to realize like this tension that I'm experiencing is actually a civil rights issue rather than like a Oh no, I'm parenting a disastrous situation. It's like, no, this is you're you're now stepping into civil rights issues. So the line that I quote in the book is Steve writes, first you should know that they have planets inside just as you do, rivers, acacia trees, windfall apples. And then the poem goes on, um, but it's like, oh yeah, my, you know, this is a whole human being. She's got a planet inside her just like anyone else. And I'm surrounded by a medical world that is not everybody was troubled, but you know, a lot of, a lot of the messaging was like, oh, this is a problem. Or later I write in the book, how like lovely, well-meaning church ladies, you know, <laughs> <laughs> would say, oh, um, you, you know, well, my grandson had such and such and you'd never know it now and that that mm. like you'd never know was like the the goal or was like right, right. was the gem i was supposed to hold on to um, right right yeah and yeah, i was no, that that the public is so poorly educated about you know human diversity to begin with and then about you know different bodies bodies of difference uh yeah. and once you're disabled yourself or you have a remarkable rare child um you walk right into the buzzsaw mm. of this astonishing complex is what mm. jung would call it right that yeah they're afraid of their own bodies uh mm. they desperately want uh to cling to the illusion that there's a kind of normative health index and they're in it it's yeah. like it's like being in the in group in school that then you discover teachers are poorly educated, uh, social workers. Uh, obviously, we've already covered the doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, people even in in uh, you know in in religious circles, mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah. you know, are often poorly educated, and and therefore, right, you have to become a warrior. Yeah. Right, and that's another astonishing thing about this book to me is that you find ways, you and Justin and Fiona mm -hmm. and Petra, sure. respectively replenish your spirits all the time. There's yeah. a lot of spirit replenishment that goes on. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I think the writing for me though is a big part of you know spirit replenishment. Like having that encounter with somebody a church and they say like, oh, you'd never know. My grandson's fine now. Um, writing it as a way of like, I don't know, alchemizing it or something, you know, like transforming it into this other, um, this thing that doesn't have to, like the experience of um, the, the microaggression of ableism doesn't have to have the final word because I get to like process that, retell it and, yeah. um, you yeah. know, yeah, speak back to it in some way, in a way that I hope is palatable, right? That like other people can can read and 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 experience the story along with it. Well, it is palatable because your voice is so um, it it's it's such a sophisticated and nuanced voice. I mean, I, that's another thing I admire about the book because I don't know that I could write it. You you have a lot of fact, uh, a lot of facts that you've had to uncover without help. You know, so you've had to be like a private investigator, you know, Sam Spade. <laughs> uh, there's uh, a lot of cultural history, right? So that you take on, uh, you know, the history of medicine and, you know, normativity after the Industrial Revolution and yeah. Leonard Davis and disability studies. Yeah. Uh, but then there's this um, capacity that you have 
to also bring in the strangely humorous, <laughs> the uh, unimaginably weird stuff that just pops up in 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 real life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you manage to stay surprised. Uh, you know, throughout mm -hmm. the book and throughout the recounting of your lives, mm -hmm. and that to me is something you can't possibly teach. That mm -hmm. you can only hope to find it. Yeah. Um, I do think that when like when I mean that's why I wanted to write about Pema Chodron a little bit too like yeah. when the rug is ripped out from under you whether it's through like awe or terror um, you are I mean I, I do find those moments to be ones where I can be more open you know because there's nothing to hold on to yeah so Sage El Shah writes this question she wrote um uh, did you rely on journals of that time how did you remember so many details um, so that's a great question. And um, Sejal, I, I, I did, I, I did write um, journals. I also kept the blog. And so when I was writing the blog, I would post things that happened like really quickly. So it'd be like three days ago, this happened and I would write about it. Um, but also I just find that my senses were really heightened during these moments, I think, cause you know, yeah. just like, because the, the rug is ripped out from under you. So for me, things just get really lit up in color. I don't have an impressive memory about everything. Like I can have the conversation with family members and they tell me all kinds of things that happened when we were five and I have no idea, but there was something, there's, you know, these, these moments with doctors were always really memorable, um, sometimes in good ways, but often not. So yeah, yeah it was yeah. a mixture of blogging, journaling and just sharp memory from, from keen moments. Because I can't see the chat. I don't know. Yeah, if we have there's just other. one more. There's just yeah. one more. Oh, oh, good. So Allison writes, which writers do you turn to for solace, a mirror, inspiration, challenge? What is your opinion of Andrew Solomon's Far From the Tree? Um, all right. Well, I don't, I don't mean to be um, like uh, bowing at the heels of my beloved mentor, but I'm super inspired by Steve Kusisto's work. Um, his memoir, Planet of the Blind, is one I reread pretty regularly and share with my students, um, as well as his other essays. Um, but I was really inspired by Leonard Davis's um, writing about normality, you know, as that like plumber's term. Yeah. Um, I'm super inspired by Jillian Weiss's work. Those of you who haven't read The Colony, it's this like brilliant novel um, that I love. Um, and I loved Andrew Solomon's Far From the Tree. I didn't, um, I did not read all the chapters for trigger reasons, but I did read many. And I, I, I think it was, it's a beautiful TED talk too, he gives. Um, yeah. So you heard me long ago at Ohio State talking about comic irony. Yeah. I've been, you know, rattling on and on about this for years, right? That basically uh, borrowing from Harold Bloom uh, the idea is that Shakespeare invented modernity. Mm -hmm. And the way that he did this was he understood that he could write a play in such a way that the people in the audience would know more about what was happening to the characters than the characters themselves knew. Yeah. And so that you could sit in the audience and go, no, oh, don't do it. Oh, it's not, the, oh, he did it. Right. That, that he says is comic irony that, yeah. you know, the audience knows more than the characters under the proscenium arch. And the only way that can happen, because the Greeks didn't have this, even though they had tragedy. Okay. The only way that can happen is if you have a literate population. Mm -hmm. People who can read can engage in that kind of irony. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that people who can read generally, this could say something about all the Trump voters, Generally, people who can read are able to ask critical questions like, what's wrong with this? Yeah. What's wrong with this story? What's wrong with what I'm hearing, right? Yeah. Uh, democracy depends on it, right? Yeah. Um, but when we're writing nonfiction, right, there comes a moment where we begin to really be swept up by, holy cow, I'm discovering all kinds of things I didn't know when I began this, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And they can be large or small, right? Mm -hmm. Like in my last memoir about traveling around the globe with a dog, right? Yeah. I began to realize that the dog made me a better human being. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. 
uh, you know, uh, more open, more generous to other people. Uh, you know, despite all the obstacles, I became more curious. Did you have some moments like that where you, you know, as you got near the end, you went, wow, this is, this is different. You know, I, I must have only because I don't consider anything I write successful if that doesn't happen. You right. know, for me, like, um, I have to discover something, even though it's nonfiction. And I know this, you know, like, I know the situation, I don't necessarily know. I don't, I don't want to know everything about what it all means or, um, yeah, like, you know, how things put, put me together. Um, I think I, I did enjoy, like there was this part where I researched the deficit uh, perspective and the capacity building perspective. Yep. Um, and so like getting to see how um, the way that like uh, Fiona's early interventionists early on were like really pushing a deficit lens, how that yep. um, weighed on me, I guess. I got to write right. into that a little bit more. But I mean, every chapter, it's it, to me, it, like it doesn't work if there's not a place where I'm surprised by right. something. I can't quite remember them. Maybe that's just like pandemic. Well, that's all right. You're also being interviewed and, you know, that's <laughs> not always the best. Uh... Let me read you a passage where I think this happens. All right. Yeah. 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 This is so you're talking about the tablet, the the iPad. Yeah. And um ironically I'm using an iPad I can now see out of one eye if I hold the thing up close which I couldn't do when we knew each other at Ohio um, so we only enabled the secondary screens for a few necessary and high preference categories food people and tv shows mm -hmm. which by the way I would argue is everything that's <laughs> Yeah, pretty she's much. smart. She's a smart yeah. cookie. That's pretty much it right there. <laughs> that, that's my whole pandemic year. Um, <laughs> when she touched eat, for instance, the device didn't say eat immediately, but instead opened up a page of words related to food. Likewise, with our, that icon opened a page of people. And when she touched look, it opened a page of videos and TV shows, Sesame Street, Yo Gaba Gaba, super simple songs. And that last phrase was precisely what I heard from the dining room table while I chopped the carrots. Super simple songs, unmistakable and clear. My girl had reclaimed the talker from mommy's backup robot to her rallying cry, her voice. Maureen had said, Give it a year. Don't expect her to intentionally use the device that whole first year. Fiona had needed just a few months. I set down my knife. I rounded the partition and looked at my kid, shocked. She looked back with those blue eyes, expectant. You want super simple songs? I asked. Her full-bodied nod shook the high chair. I opened the tablet. I searched through the internet. By God, reader. I gave that girl her TV show. <laughs> ah, you know, that is just too great. That's Meanwhile, just... you may be hearing my child sh shouting for whatever she wants right now in the background. To this. As oh, it should oh. be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're eating, they're the family's eating dinner right now. So yeah, yeah. Thanks that's for that. reading that. That's, yeah, that's a little victory. That's a huge, that was a huge victory moment, right? Like, uh, yeah. it's a huge victory moment, but it's also one where you're suddenly forced to step back and go, holy cow, mm. look at these people. Look what's going on here. Yeah. You know, the day didn't start out this way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dan says we have time for one more question. Dan, Great. there's one. Kathleen says, what is your best advice for parents that are in similar shoes? Um, oh, yeah. Um, my, my best advice is, well, I mean, is to find the people who see your kid as whole and see all their strengths and celebrate them and like follow those people and chase them and keep them in your life. And to be, to just have those antenna on for the people who are 
um, focused on deficits and ab like out quote abnormalities and right. try to weed them out as much as possible. Right. Uh, you can't unfortunately weed them all out. And so sometimes you can educate them sometimes, but um, my other advice is like, you know, do your educating if you need to, but don't exhaust yourself. You know, there are sometimes you can switch, switch professionals, switch educators. But yeah, follow the celebration, follow the, the, the wholeness, the completeness, and find those people who help you keep that frame of mind. And if you don't have that yet, it's okay. Give yourself lots of grace and forgiveness because you don't live in a culture that taught you it. And so, um, uh, find, you know, look for that sense of, of whole perspective. Well, thanks for the, thanks for being here, Steve. It's really oh, nice to see you. Are you kidding? Absolutely. I'm honored. I, well, I want to say one more thing, which is that I could say 20 more things, but one more thing in particular is that Fiona really emerges in this book. Mm. And you know, she she comes through as a whole, rich, beautiful, intriguing, full and mysterious person. Mm. And no parent can write that way about their child, you know, in general. I mean, how many books have we read about kids that, you know, they people just make their kids into hand puppets? Um, mm -hmm. Your deep advocacy for her uh, and, you know, your your poetic sensibility really help us you know know her it's a it's terrific thanks thanks steve it was really that was really wonderful thank you so much heather thank you to steven uh i want to thank our funders here uh, um, you can catch up with uh previous readings on our website uh including this one will be the, up there uh eventually uh and i want to say uh, thank you for coming and have a great night. Awesome. Thanks, thank everybody. You thank you. Yep. All right. Stay safe. Enjoy, folks. Bye-bye.